Julian, how are you doing today? I am fantastic, Dave. Cool. Um, what is your thoughts, I guess? Um, we replayed the show that you were on uh, the Friday before the Monday where the driver was revealed as Rikishi, <laughs> and everybody thought that it was like, you know, some plot that we knew it was going to happen, and uh, and it wasn't, because I had no idea it was going to be Rikishi till that night. And uh, Anyway, what's your thoughts on all that? You, you're right, Dave, because I, I got that, com that comment myself, and I got quite a few emails asking me what I knew about it, because the same thing had happened when I predicted to Booker T that he'd win the title, and he won it a week later. Um, everyone thinks that I'm on. <laughs> That's because you, you saw the lawsuit settlement papers. No? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, but let me make this announcement loud and clear. I am not on any professional wrestling organization's payroll. Not that I'm neither, not neither, by the way, neither, by the way, am I, just in case. <laughs> people want to lie and make up stories this week. Exactly, yeah. That's Hey, I got the same thing, Dave. Uh, and I thought it was ironic, too, because someone sent me an email and said, hey, check out The Observer Live. They're rerunning your show again. You know, and I said, like, uh-oh. And then another thing about the whole Austin Driver angle, it happened on Columbus Day. Um you know, if you think about Christopher Columbus and Ben Fatu saying uh, White Boys Club for the WWF, I just thought that timing was just very interesting, the way they did the whole thing. But uh, the thing that intrigued me the most about the whole angle, not the way it went down the very first day, uh, but the reaction to this, the announcement by the live audience, uh, at least the way I was watching it and the, the way it was coming across to me, um, Jim Ross was selling one thing, and the live audience seemed to be somewhat indifferent or shocked. Some were booing, and then there were even a spattering of uh, cheers for what the man was saying and when he was walking out of the arena. I thought it was nice that he did the roll call of Nature Boy Buddy Rogers and Bruno Sammartino all the way through Hope. I, I didn't Stone because Hogan got a Hogan got a pop, and I was thinking like, oh no. And I hadn't heard a cheer like that for Hogan in several years, and especially and I didn't expect that in the WWF. And uh, then he went down the list of Samoans, the Jimmy Snookers and Peter Mavia, and uh, himself and Samu, the head shrinkers. So it was interesting the reaction by the live audience. I don't think the WWF. Well, it's obvious the WWF didn't get the reaction that night that they wanted. They, he is since become more of a heel character uh it may have it may have worked better in south carolina or texas maybe and they would have probably got the reaction that they wanted but the whole race angle didn't didn't affect me at all people just assume like you dave that i'm on someone's payroll and that i knew what was going to happen <laughs> uh let's see i've got uh, this is someone are you gonna let brian yeah, this is actually something that a question that you brought up so anyway read this one it says, can you attribute the recent drop in viewership in WCW to the fact that WWF has switched to TNN? <laughs> How do you like that excuse, Brian? That's a good one. The, the Russo era seemed to, this is the, here's the explanation. The Russo era seemed to eliminate a good chunk of the WCW only fans in favor of attracting the WF's target audience. It would make sense that WWF fans that stopped watching after that after the switch, were also the fans who propped up Nitro's first hour and flipped back and forth between the shows. What do you think? I, I don't think that I don't think that that the switch to TNN had any effect whatsoever on WCW's ratings, as evidenced by the fact that this was the period they were supposed to gain ratings and, and they, they lost them. Helped them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Also, you were wondering how WCW could spin the ratings lately in a positive way. Here's the latest argument: because the gap hasn't changed between the two shows. Uh. Uh. Because the, the gap hasn't changed, so everything's the same. Because, <laughs> you know, WWF numbers. Of course, WWF numbers went up this last week. And Even WCW though they had 1.6 in the uh, second hour, everything's the same. Every, yeah, because WWF numbers were only like a 5.0 or something at the same time. I see. Uh, only triple. They were only triple. What about SmackDown? What about, what about it? What about it? <laughs> oh, God. Got a couple of emails. Uh... Uh, let's see. Um, Julian, jump in. Uh, this is uh, from. This is. Have you tried to get a statement from Eric Bischoff himself to shoot down all the rumors? Bischoff hasn't been interviewed for, by anyone I know. A bottom line, Dave, is there any chance of getting an interview with Eric Bischoff soon? Let's stop talking about it and start doing it. Uh, he's. I am sure that he is not ready to come on this show just yet. <laughs> I can just tell you that. As far as anything else, I uh, can't really respond. Um, 
I heard you on Tuesday's show talk, discussing the possibility of Triple H being engaged to China. A listener emailed you saying that during Triple H's segment on Regis, he said he wasn't married, but then said soon. Actually, the word he didn't say was soon. The word he said was, I'm single. And then he proceeded to spend the rest of the segment trying to hit on Regis's co-host. There is a big difference between soon and single when it comes to getting Who is married. Oh, boy. Co-host? I don't know. I, I Julian, haven't you know? watched that show ever. No, I have no idea. Okay, I haven't. I, I haven't watched it in a long time, either. Uh, let's well, see. if China, if China ever decides to kick into the curb again, and she, if she's taking applications, you know, she she can get my number anytime. Okay. I've always been interested in, you know, I've, I've, I was a phys ed major in college, so I always liked those muscular, athletic females I like that. Anyway. Sci-fi major. <laughs> Say that again. What was that, Brian? What was that, Brian? A science fiction major. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, this is from Adrian Pickworth. Uh, in Australia, who said, uh, I was wondering if you had any rough figures on how the demographics of the WF's audience has changed since the PTC influence and forced them to change the direction of their product. I remember a few weeks back, you said the number of kids watching has dropped significantly while the rest of the audience has stayed fairly consistent. What has this effect had on their merchandise sales? Uh, I mean, we know I the toy. to plug the observer because last week, last week had plenty of ratings and demographic information in the observer. Yeah, more than anyone needs. Like a page. I know. Well, it was about time. Um, as, as far as um, actually in going through uh, the last couple of weeks of TV, on Raw and Heat, and I would presume SmackDown, there's still like a lot of kids watching. The shows that kids don't watch and adults still watch, where the number of the, the kids' audience has dropped severely, is a live wire and superstar. So to me, I think that the kids have smartened up uh, faster than the adults on which shows is absolutely worthless watching. <laughs> So, but um, no merchandise sales. Um, you know, merchandise in the arena, which is mainly your T-shirts and things like that. That's fine. Um, in fact, that's doing very good, especially since Austin's been back on the road. Um, some of the do the dolls and things like that. Obviously, Jack Specific. You know, uh, they had a they had a bad period there, and um, you know that those numbers are down, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, Wall Street, you know, kicked them to the curb again a couple. What was it, about two weeks ago? Uh, this is a question. Um, of the two tigers that appeared on Monday night, Scott Steiner's tiger and Tiger Ali Singh, which one has the better work rate? <laughs> WCW Tiger. Yeah, I guess. Uh, let's see. What was the reason for Bobby Heenan leaving the WWF? Uh, it was, that was a money thing. Um, just They didn't renew his contract. His contract was up, and they didn't offer him a new contract, so he went to WCW. Uh, let's see. This is from someone who says, uh, I read about the possible WCW sale and read that Nash and Sting have some 90-day clause, or maybe it's that they don't have the clause. Actually, it's that they don't have the clause. So, anyway, the, the rest of that's just about Sting and how great he is. Um, last seven years. Okay, here's, here's an interesting trivia note. Um, for seven consecutive years, the person who has uh, won the main event at Survivor Series has lost at WrestleMania. Uh, 1992, Bret Hart uh, kept the title Survivor Series, which I think was that's, that's probably with Shawn Michaels, wasn't it? Cleveland? Yeah. And then he lost it to Yokozuna at WrestleMania, the ensuing WrestleMania. At Survivor Series in 93, Yokozuna kept the title. That would have been with Luger. And then he lost it to Bret Hart. Uh, the next... Wait, this, is, this doesn't have 1994 here. Wait a minute. Where's... Oh, oh well. Maybe, maybe 1994. The funny thing about these patterns... Is that oh, ex except for WrestleMania 11. Okay, and the guy Hector Ruiz, who, who wrote this in, specifically said this has happened every year except at WrestleMania 11. So 94 is the exception. Okay. Um, so tell me about the patterns, and I'll go on with this. Vince McMahon on Raw this past Monday said Yokozuna was a three-time champion, which was yeah. wrong. Yes. And I think the chances of him having absolutely any sort of pattern is like zero. No, I think he has a pattern. It's just that he has. A, I think that he does have a subconscious pattern. He just doesn't know it. I, I, I actually believe that. But you know, but it's not like it's not like it's not like he has it written down. Like this is what I'm going to do. It just it just works out that like, way because it's like a formula. Yeah, it's like a formula that he doesn't even know that he does. Do you know what I mean? Kind of like Dusty Rhodes had that formula that like killed business when he was booking. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't. I mean, it wasn't like he really had a formula. He just like this is how he booked, and it you know that was the result. Um, Okay, so 95. Okay, SummerSlam of 95, Bret Hart kept the title. 
Uh, who was that against? I don't even remember who we fought in some, that SummerSlam. Was that a Owen? Maybe Owen. Uh, no, I think Owen was 94. Okay, anyway. WrestleMania, Bret Hart lost to Shawn Michaels. Okay, SummerSlam 1996, Sid wins the title from Shawn Michaels. WrestleMania, Sid lost to Undertaker. SummerSlam 97, Shawn Michaels won the title. Uh, oh, the Survivor, these are all Survivor Series. I'm, I'm, I totally botched this whole thing up. Although it works with SummerSlams, too. But, but anyway, Survivor 77, Shawn Michaels wins the title. WrestleMania, uh, Shawn Michaels lost to Steve Austin. 98, Summer, uh, Survivor Series, Rock wins the title. At WrestleMania, he lost to Austin. In Survivor Series 1999, Big Show won the title. And at WrestleMania, he lost in the four-way. So, although he uh, wasn't the champion at that time. That one's stretching so. it. Well, it did happen. Um, but you're right, it is a stretch because, and especially to consider that part of the pattern because Big Show got the title, you know, I mean, everyone knows Big Show just got the title just because it was like one of those things like, oh, we got to do something to make the people happy because they're going to be really pissed. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like that was like part of any pattern that was booked. It just was like, oh, we got to keep those people from being pissed. We're going to put in a sub and, and to make sure that, you know, we're going to make that sub win the title. Let's go to Terry in North Carolina. Terry, what's going on? How are you doing, Dave? Doing really good. Okay, how are you doing, Julian? Hey Terry. Okay. Um. Yes, I got a um a, a comment or a question. Um. Okay. Uh, I think it's back during the GWF days, the Global Wrestling Federation days. You remember a long time ago, uh, when it was, I think it was fans were chanting on uh, who there it is, and then he was like, um, I'm like, why y'all saying who there it is for? Ain't none of y'all black. And I think Bradshaw was doing commentary with, like Ice Peas and Ice Cubes or whatever. What y'all thought about it? Did did we do anything about that? I don't remember this. Y'all remember that in the GWF? No, I don't. <clears throat> I mean, I remember Black Bart and I remember the GWF, but I don't remember that incident. Yeah, they made that comment. Um, ain't none of y'all fans black. Uh, it happened back in like in 1993. Okay. I in that so. era. I don't know, Julian, do you, do you remember that at all? Uh, not that particular in incident, but I do remember, uh, you know, quite a few comments like that uh, by wrestlers and announcers and mm -hmm. managers and. <laughs> and others. <laughs> I don't particularly remember that specific incident, but I have heard incidents like that, yes. Oh, yeah. What you think about the gangsters um, also? The gangsters, as, uh -huh. for, as far as the, the way they were promoted originally, which, which you mean like over in Smoky Mountain or yeah, CW? Smoky Mountain, yeah. I, was, I wasn't surprised that it worked. To be to be totally honest, it, with it, you. it didn't it didn't it didn't work. It didn't really really work, but I mean, you know what I mean. I wasn't surprised that it didn't get the the reaction. You know what I mean? It, it got heat, but it, it it you know it killed the company. Not that the company was. <laughs> well, it did kill the company. Well, I mean that's yeah. That, <laughs> that did le that did help the company go, but <laughs> no question about it. Cause I remember watching one of these syndicate on television shows, and um, they had like the comments of the uh, gangsta parental advisory. They had it every uh, time. Was that was that something that that uh, Cornette put on this on, on to make it like more like forbidden fruit, or was it something that the station did because the station was embarrassed about what, what, what they were broadcasting? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't I don't I don't know. I mean, when Cornette's when Cornette's on, we could we could ask about uh, about that. I remember when when Cornette went with that thing. Um, and the first interview where, you know, New Jack was talking about, you know, um, you know, like what O.J. did was justified or something like that. And I was right. just going like, oh, God, oh, God, this is going in the wrong direction. <laughs> right. And uh, and uh, anyway, and, and he, then they went further and further. Well, it took someone like Cornette, you know, who's willing to push the envelope to try something like that in that particular part of the country. I, it hadn't been tried to that degree before, I don't think. It's specifically in that particular part of the country. But, Terry, man, my reaction to that is similar to what I was talking about earlier with uh, the Rakishi Fatu uh, first announcement that he was the driver who hit Austin. Um, sometimes when they blatantly play that race card, I think sometimes promoters misread their own audience. They're, they're, they're so brilliant, and they know their audience. Sometimes they misread. Okay, I got another one, too. Okay, you think, uh, like, um, the stock will go down if um, they officially announce that The Rock is black? Because you're not going to acknowledge that, that on Sunday. It, make, it, won't make, it won't make the slightest bit of difference. I'm going <laughs> to. 
<laughs> Dave, Dave, I always have to deal with that issue, man. I know you do. I know you do. Well, you put them on the cover of your book. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm telling you. What are you doing putting a white guy on the cover of your book? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing that that whole concept, you know. Again, I have never publicly stated that I'm a black man, but I don't think people have to do anything other than look at me, and they can tell. You know, I have I have mixed I have I have mixed uh, races in my own family background. I mean, so what? Who cares? I Doesn't remember. Matter. I remember, uh, and I, I think this would have been Tony Atlas, but it, it really doesn't matter who it was, but there was some wrestler who came to a territory. I couldn't even remember the, ter don't even remember the territory. And, and, you know, he's in the ring, and they're going, you know, the great black superstar. You know, and he's right on TV, and I'm going like, why do they call him the black superstar? Everyone watching can see for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't get me wrong. I, I am of the school of thought that Vince McMahon is one of the greatest promoters uh, of our era. No doubt about that. I am of that school of thought. However, McMahon has promoted some of the most blatant stereotypes that the world has ever seen. And, um, you know... Saba, I, Saba Simba being one of them. Saba Simba certainly being one of them. No question about that. Um, but, I mean, I'm not surprised. The thing I always am amazed about is this is what I call the Elvis Presley syndrome or the Elvis... Oh, yeah, I read about that. You know, and, um, and this is real. Um, but the reverse of the Elvis effect where you have guys like your Dusty Rhodes or Jimmy Valiant or Hulk Hogan and Flair taking on black mannerisms, mm -hmm. the reverse is also true, you know, because quite frankly, as quiet as it is kept, a lot of white fans really like a lot of black athletes. Regardless really? to their skin tone, I know it's never <laughs> spoken publicly. No one ever will admit to it. Okay, now wait a minute. Not. Is that why they put Michael Jordan in all those commercials? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> oh, okay, that's why. No question about it. You know, I mean, really, a lot of white fans enjoy watching black athletes perform. And if you're good, people will respond to the fact that you're good. Certainly there's racism out there, no question about it. Certainly there's stereotypes and there, there are people with small, myopic mindsets. No question about that. But a guy like Rocky was, uh, Ro listen, Rocky is ours, and we're not giving him away. Okay? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to my white fans out there. Rocky's one of us, and we're not letting him go, okay? Okay. And, um, okay, uh, Dave Meltzer, what you think about, um, let's see, um, Tony Norris um, used to be uh, Mary Johnson. You thought he was a good worker before he started getting all these injuries? <laughs> I never thought he was a good worker. <laughs> You know what though? When he when he first broke in, mm -hmm. he was really agile for a big guy. But I think that there was this point where like the learning stopped, and it was just too early in his career. And and then when he went to the WWF, he had so much success in a short period of time. And, and a lot of wrestlers, uh, we talk about them all the time, that get success really fast in the business. Uh, sometimes they don't progress because they they start believing their press. And unfortunately. Tony, you know, Tony Norris when he was in WWF, you know, aside from being injured a lot and injuring other people, uh, never really progressed. And you know, since he left WWF, he's never done anything. Hey, hey, Brian, Brian, do you know if he's still under contract to WCW? He's in the power plant. He's at the power plant? Uh huh. Training, yeah, trying to lose weight also. He's still around. I didn't hear wow. that. Wow, I never heard that either. Yeah, that's what they were saying one time. Him and Sam Greco are probably out there at the power plant. <laughs> Dave, you know I caught that, too. Uh, I, I put Ahmed Johnson on the cover of my book, and at that time he was missing in action. And all of a sudden he showed up in WCW. So once again, people uh -huh. accused me of knowing something. Okay. <laughs> we got to check of... on Tony Norris. Yeah. I think check. that he was never even under contract. Oh, oh they were choosing him on, on, a, on like a daily thing? I, I thought that I don't know. I don't. I don't I know remember. That's what they were doing, but maybe they signed him. I don't know. I don't know. It's from Richard Sullivan, who goes, "It's interesting that the only part of Razor Ramon's gimmick the WWF didn't rip off from the Diamond Stud gimmick was the accent, which they ripped off from Al Pacino's character in Scarface." That's, but they own the gimmick. Um, this is one that's been going around. A couple people. This is from Kevin Gregg, but several people have emailed this. Uh, they were, Isn't Yokozuna the youngest WF champion ever and not The Rock? Yokozuna would have been 27 as the champion, probably just a few months younger than uh, 
than the 27 or even 28 that Rock was when he won the title at Survivor Series in 1998. Now, based on what... Rock was 26. Yeah, the, the, the claim is that Rock was 26. So Rock would have been younger. Um, Yokozuna would have been, let's see, he was born in 66, so he'd have been 27 uh, when he won the title. Which Now, what should have he won the title? In 19... Was it... Uh, God, I'm just, I'm just trying to... Um, see, he won the title from... Uh, was it from Brett? Yeah, got it from Brett, Brett, Brett and, 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 at WrestleMania, right? And then he lost it in 10 seconds to Hogan, right? Okay, so he was 27. Now, I'm trying to think, Bruno would have been... Bruno San Martino would have been 27 when he won the title from Buddy Rogers. Uh, Morales was not young. Uh, Backlund... See, Backlund was born in 49, so he would have been older because he won the title in 78, so he'd have been... Uh, but it was January 78, so he'd have been 28... Uh, so I think Rock would be the youngest. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, let's see another one. There's, uh, let's see. Uh, this is from Brandon who says, in regards to Vincent Man calling Yokozuna a three-time champion on the opening of Raw, I think what he said three times, he meant two world titles and one world tag team title. You know what's so great about Vince is that like even when he makes just like an honest mistake, that when he does, people will always find a way that Vince was still not wrong. That's right. That he still wasn't wrong. Still was. He wasn't even an honest mistake. It just he knew. What he, he he knew. He was actually adding in those tag team reigns. We just didn't figure it out ourselves. Okay. Uh, so Ric Flair, when uh, Ric Flair must be about a forty-time champion by now. Uh, um, okay. Uh, there's something. Else. Oh, let me get some stuff here for uh, Julian. It's from John in West Virginia, who goes. Um, I live in West Virginia. It used to be uh, the Detroit promotion. Uh, uh, area. We saw a lot of Bobo Brazil, Sailor Art Thomas, Big Money Hank James. Oh, I remember. I just I just watched Hank James on a tape this weekend. <laughs> That's a name Splash I haven't heard in a long time. And after watching that tape, you I, I know why. A magnificent <laughs> Magnificent Zulu. That's another one. Oh my God. Big Red. Oh, Big Red. Remember him? I remember Big Red. Yeah. And others. Bobo was always a huge baby face. I once saw him on a tape in Japan against Jack Briscoe, and he was foaming at the mouth. And I think uh, Reverend Tim, Tiny Tim Hampton was in his corner. What was that? He owned his career in Japan, and was Hank James really his brother? Um, Julian, I think Hank James wasn't his brother, but they were billed as half brothers. But they, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't. I actually don't know though. I, I don't think they were. I, I, yeah, I, I have no record that they were. I think when Bobo died, um, we checked into that, and there was actually no relation because that was always rumored that they were half brothers. Right. Um, Bobo, as far as Japan. Uh, Bobo wasn't, you know, in Japan they really didn't have baby faces and heels. Uh, Bobo was just Bobo, and um, you know he didn't, you know, he wrestled a more. I it was just Bobo was Bobo Brazil. He wasn't a heel at all in Japan. Um, let me see what other thing here. Uh, this is from Maurice Forrester, who says in your book you mentioned some African American wrestlers from the early 20th and late 19th century, so the turn of the century. How popular was wrestling among African Americans during that time? Did the popularity change as blacks migrated to the northern cities, where their promoters specifically working in black communities? Like, has there ever been? Um, well, I mean, aside from like Urban Wrestling Federation, has there ever been a promotion that specifically targeted blacks? Because generally speaking, the hierarchy of pro wrestling. The United States has, has rarely allowed uh, African Americans into the real hierarchy. I, don't, I can't even recall one like major African American promoter off the top of my head. Not a not a major promoter. I can't either. Uh, it, it, you mentioned before when we talked the last time that Ernie Ladd had worked with uh, you know Bill Watson. You worked for those guys, but Ernie, Ernie Ladd was book, Ernie Ladd booked in several areas. Yeah, but he but he was nowhere near actually ever being a promoter. I can't I can't recall any. In all fairness, uh, the, the the black market has, to my knowledge, been basically totally incidental in the minds of the majority of promoters. Um, it's it's always it's always been a case where black fans appreciated the business, but the business was never really targeted toward black fans, to my knowledge. I, I think Watts did. I well, know with Watts the exception did. of Watts, Watts knew where Watts knew his 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 area, and he knew what he could do. You know, there have been you know um, in Texas and other places um, over in the Seattle, the Pacific Northwest areas where they had heavy uh, non-white populations, and they promoted uh, you know with that in mind. But yeah, you're right. Probably with the exception of Watts, no one had ever really promoted. Well, and Watts knew what he had. The advantage of the viewership that they had. I'm sorry. 
Do you think it was more targeting that audience or just making no. the most of the fact that they had those viewers? Not targeting, you, not targeting no, that audience, but make, no, but or, yeah. Or, Watts was targeting that audience without, I mean, I, I can tell you it's actually. Watts was, I mean, you know, with Watts. Like JYD or? Uh, I, I think um, at the beginning with JYD, he was, I mean, I think JYD, which was, you know, um, I think that he was targeting the audience to an extent and succeeded far beyond his wildest dreams. After JYD, he kept targeting that audience with, with a lot less success with, you know, the endless parade of people Reeves, Savannah Jack uh, uh, even uh, um, God, there was like what if they remember Eddie, Eddie Lee Crawford for a little while when yeah. they put him over everybody right. and, right. and um, uh, you know but there, there, it was like he 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 was tar he was trying to get you know the new JYD George remember George Wells he pushed George Wells before George the Wells, right. right yeah when when JYD left he tried to make George Wells into the the new JYD that, that's right uh, master G yeah yeah, but he was Master G for a very brief period of time. And I got, um, George, I got George Wells in the book, and you mentioned Zulu. I got Zulu in the book, too. Zulu. I got all of those guys in there. Yeah, Ron, big Ron Pope. I got him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's him. But, yeah, I think I think with Watts, but even with Watts, even though he tried to do it, I think it still was more a like a light coming on. He, he being a businessman and saw he had this audience here, not that he went out and cultivated that audience yeah. and brought them there. But once he discovered that the, here they are, their money spent just as well as anyone else's. I think I think Ernie Ladd like convinced him, and Ernie Ladd was the one like you know we can never beat JYD. And of course, you know it's real easy in that era. Okay, it's it's harder today. But in that era, if you put a guy over every single person, you know usually can create a pretty big star. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and and that's what they did with JYD. Is they just you know put them over everybody, and they created. But but it was, you know, New Orleans had never been a big money city, and you know with JYD it was like you know one of the biggest money cities in the whole country at that at that point. Right. And you know, uh, but yeah, I think I think I don't I don't think anyone else that I could come up with specifically did. Although I think there was always that thing that like you know if Thunderbolt Patterson or Rocky Johnson or whoever the wrestlers were in that era that were on top that it would help. You know, draw people like just like I mean, in this area, just as an example, it was always I mean, always you you know, Mexican wrestlers. Uh, they uh, and then they were brought in specifically to draw Mexican fans because of the thought that Mexicans naturally loved professional wrestling. There's more of a you know that that family heritage of going to pro wrestling, and it was um, you know, but I, I remember that in in Roy Shires always would have the, the you know you would have the white guy. Then he would have the we always had a Samoan because the Samoans drew in San Francisco because of the Samoan contingent. They'd always have the the, the, the African American, the black wrestler, and they would always have the Mexican wrestler. And those were always so so it was, it was Pat Patterson and and revolving ethnic baby faces in this area. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> good let's go to Rick. <laughs> yeah, let's go to Rick in Ohio. Rick, what's going on? Hey guys, Dave, Julian, Super Chico. Uh, before I get to my question, well, there is one, I guess you could say, African-American promoter, Aja Kong, with Arson. Um, Arson. Well, she, she, she is, is she running the entire company? Because I think Rossi Ogawa kind of runs the I'm company. I'm not sure. I know she books it. Yeah, well, there have been bookers, you know. Not a lot of them, by the way, but there have been a few. Mm. But, uh, yeah. No, you can't claim Aja Kong because she's um, half Japanese. Yeah, but the rock, yeah, but I'm just teasing. I'm only, I'm only teasing. I'm totally teasing. Don't worry. Okay. Anyway, my question is, uh, Dave, that yesterday on the show, when you were talking about various women in wrestling and like the shape they were in, the caller said something about Lita. I think he said something like, "Forget the implants. Lita's in better shape right now than she was in ECW." And you yes. said, "Well, you don't know uh, how she got." Like that, or what she did? Yeah, no. I, I mean, you, what you just you never. Implying, I wasn't implying anything. I was just saying that you don't know. I mean, she might have starved herself. I mean, that's not uncommon yeah, among not, women. Not that skinny, though. Um, I'll tell you something. I know a lot of women who are not that skinny who starve themselves, and I'm not saying that she does. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, a lot of times when women drop a lot of weight in a hurry, that's how they do it. I mean, models and things like that. I mean, you know, models. Um, have you ever been to like models or like a beauty contest? You'll find that so many of the women like smoke like crazy to compensate for the hunger pains because they don't want to eat. Uh, I'm not saying that, she, and I'm not saying she does that. I'm just saying that, you know, that women that are on women, women that are on television in general uh, eat very little. 
I mean, because especially when you're wearing unforgiving costumes, whether you're Nitro Girls uh, or, you know, a w women wrestlers, because of the, the public's expectation of what a woman on television is supposed to look like is something that is very, very difficult and in many cases impossible to achieve. I mean, um, God, I've just been reading, you know, and Brian knows this better than I do, you know, gymnastics. I mean, it's worse than wrestling, you know, I mean, because those, right, those girls... Yeah, that book, it's just scary as hell when you have all of these women that are, you know, 80 and 90 pounds. Five feet tall. And, and under, under five, well, 90 pounds. Well, the thing with the under five feet tall business, I mean, they must have done stuff to stunt their growth in a lot of cases. People by not eating, don't you think? pounding. Is it, okay, the constant pounding. On, Five okay. years old on up. Yeah. I think the thing with Lita, I don't think she's been starving herself. I think she's just gotten more oh, toned. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know anything one way or the other. I just, I'm just saying that when you're in the public eye, and I know that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the women, I mean, I know several of the women, and we're going to have Missy Hyatt on, and we'll see if she talks about it when she's on. But, I mean, I know that, like, I mean, she used to go through those ups and downs, like all of them, because you're on TV and you got that pressure. I mean, I would guess that, um, and again, I don't know about lead in specific, but I would think that there's a lot of, um, you know, eating problems with uh, with probably most of the women that are, um that are in professional wrestling. I mean, I know that uh, in what was it, in women's sports that over half of the women had eating disorders yeah. uh, in, in collegiate women's sports, mm -hmm. and they're not, and they're not. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? They don't have to look like these wrestling women. I mean, those standards, their standards are not that high. And I mean, among models, it's probably you know and much. They don't have to attempt to maintain that naturally while on the road. Well, that's the other key on the road, and also. The other thing about the wrestling women, which is so hard, is that unlike, say, the bodybuilding women or even the models, um, is that you got to maintain it year-round. Like a model can starve down for two weeks before a shoot, and then they can relax a little bit. Um, you know, a bodybuilder only has to be in shape the day of the show. Uh, when these wrestling women, any of them, these the women in wrestling, I mean, they can't have, they can't gain that ten pounds and get a little bit of gut and fat on their legs, you know, unless, you know, they can't, they can't do it. And and, and naturally, uh, women, um, I mean, that's women, women's bodies naturally hang on to body fat, you know, it's just, it's just the nature of, of, of how they're cursed or, or whatever it is because of childbearing or whatever it is, and, you know, especially when you're getting to be like, you know, in your Late twenties or or thirties, and some of the rest of them, like Terry Reynolds, Deborah, you know, I mean, they're they're well into their thirties. Deborah's forty, you know, Terry's probably thirty four, thirty five. Sable, you know, what's was about thirty thirty five. Uh, those women have got to be doing something, and it's it's more than just exercise and, and eating healthy diets. I mean, it's you know, they they they've got to be under eating or or something. I mean, you like Lillian Garcia, and she's skinnier than uh, Lita. I, I never said I never said that Lillian Garcia didn't, did or didn't do anything like that. I, I'm just making the point that, as a general rule, women that you're going to see on television, um, not all of them, but pretty much most of them, you know, are going to be just like the guys in the steroids. It's, it's the exact same thing and the exact same principle. You know, I mean, someone, in fact, um, there was a WWF executive uh, who shall remain nameless who was at the bar not all that long ago and basically was being, you know, some fans were talking to him and just going like, you know, why do you push all these steroid guys like Helmsley and Kane and blah, blah, blah. As I mentioned, all these guys, why don't you push like, you know, Benoit and why don't you push, you know, whatever. And he just kind of looks at him and goes, what, you think that like, you know what I mean? What are you saying? You mean as in which guys aren't on steroids? <laughs> as in which guys aren't? As, as if, like, the guys that he, you know, you push all these steroid guys, why aren't you pushing this, this, and this guy who are good technical wrestlers? And it's like, because they're good technical wrestlers, that doesn't mean that they're not on steroids, you know? I mean, I remember in the in the 80s... Um, I like it. Oh, 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 hey, this, oh, this, this, it's ridiculous to single out. I mean, it, you'd be a lot better off singling out guys who weren't on steroids than guys who are, but... I, I mean, I remember uh, at, at a wrestling fan convention once, um, you know, there's this big discussion over, you know, they were pushing Sid and, you know, this, these guys. And this is when, like, the Steiner brothers were, like, you know, first breaking as a tag team. They were doing all those innovative moves. Oh, is this and, when you did the Q&A at the John Arezzi convention? No, this had been years. This is years before this. This is, like, 1991 or something. Yeah, well, maybe it was. you did the Q&A. Okay, may have been. May have been. Okay. So, anyway, the, the um, that's right, because the Arezzi thing was early 90s. But, anyway, the... Um, you know, and somebody um, brought up the Steiner brothers to somebody else, and they're going like, well, that's okay because they're good workers. And it's like, 
you know, it's like whether you know, like it's like if they're good workers or you like them or you think they're pretty, that doesn't mean that they're adverse to doing the same things that the people you don't like are doing. You know. I I just want, have you seen like the old Davy Boy Smith tapes where he's like thin as a rail? Oh, of course. When he first came over from England, when he was 175 pounds, sure. No, I mean that stuff's like it's just weird to watch. I mean, so what you're saying is that even if someone doesn't look like it, there's a good chance they are, with a lot of different things. Um, yeah. I mean, like, like, not everyone with an eating disorder looks like Terry Runnels. No, 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 no I know, I know, I know. It, I mean, it's just that there's been like wrestlers who weren't muscle freaks that were on steroids. Oh, well, and there's wrestlers that were on steroids that never, like, actually went to the gym, and they just had that kind of bloated look that, you know, like, Rick like Hunt. maybe... Had that. Holding water. Holding, you know, that holding water, yeah, the holding water look. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's it. Okay. Uh, we got a full bank of calls. Let's go to Leroy. Leroy, you're up with Julian. Uh, how you doing, Dave? Julian, Brian. Hey. Um, I just want to know, when you just said about uh, WWF claimed that The Rock is 26, how old is he really? I don't know. <laughs> now? Uh, I mean, now. Now I'm 28. I, he could be. The only, okay. I see, I got these memories, okay, of me being 14 and The Rock being 5. And that doesn't add up, if you know what I mean. That would make him a couple years older than he is. Okay. Um, so, but I, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. And in his book, but then again, in his book, you know, he was kind of like exaggerating because he would talk about like you know going to the Cow Palace and seeing uh, Stevens and Patterson as a tag team, and Stevens and Patterson as a tag team. Um, I mean, that was, you know, I mean, they, you know, Stevens was gone from Northern California in '71, although he came back every now and then at the Cow Palace afterwards. But really, the last time I remember Stevens and Patterson as a team. Except for one match, which was a couple of years later, I think uh, maybe 76, 77, would have been 72, and that's the year that The Rock says he was born. So how does he remember? You know, how does he remember this? How, he wasn't even there. Uh huh. You know. So, but I, so I don't know exactly. Okay. Um, I was calling about Asia Kong. Um, I've been watching her like for years, and I wasn't really sure, you know, what was her racial background. I actually asked you that question about a couple of weeks ago. But uh, what does Julian think of her? Is is she in her book or? Because I think she's, you know, I think she's awesome. Well, she was young. She was awesome. Yeah. Have you seen Aja Kong? A, a little, not not much of her, but a little. Well, when you think she has to be the most decorated, uh, probably one of the most decorated in terms of belts and match quality, black wrestlers they are. Oh, no question about it. Huh. No question about it. I was a Without worker. A yeah. As a worker, as a worker, you know. As far as accomplishment, she always reminded me of like a, a female Van Vader. Yeah, uh, yeah, and a yeah, that's that's pretty good analogy. More scary. Yeah, because I remember watching tapes of Van Vader and uh, him versus all those Japanese guys, and they was always you know smaller than him, and it was like uh, he was like physically intimidating. You know the thing with with Aja Kong that nobody know under knows is that she's so short. I mean, I mean she's like. Huge, but she's like, um, and I guess because a lot of those Japanese women wrestlers are pretty short. But um, I mean, for a woman who was as short as she is, I think that she's the scariest short wrestler, <laughs> man or woman, in the history of this industry. You know, someone who's what is she you like, know, like five by five. Um, you know, it's hard for me to picture exactly right now, but I'm thinking shorter than that. I'm thinking like five three. You know, but just you know, two hundred pounds maybe, just maybe more. Are so tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. And yesterday, uh, Brian said that he wouldn't let uh Kurt Henning or Marty Jannetty watch his bags. What did he mean? I know it has to be a funny story. With that. They did a lot of ribs. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys. Uh, Sean, yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or or the Bulldogs. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to Matt. Matt, what's going on? Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? We're doing very good. Hey. Well, that's good. Um, who uh, is Kurt Angle the shortest WWF champion of all time? Shortest? Shortest. Sh shortest. That's an interesting question. Um, I should get my that record book out there. He might be. <coughs> I'll, I'll... How tall was the Iron Sheik? He's taller than, taller than Kurt Angle. He's taller than Kurt. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he'd be taller How than tall Kurt. Kurt, like five Except... ten. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Let's see. I bet, I'll bet you five nine, five ten. Probably, probably closer to five nine. I bet. Aren't um, usually WWF five, champions like over six foot sometimes? 
Because Michaels was like just at six, maybe even a little shorter. Yeah, he's shorter than Michaels. Because you know, if you look at Angle compared to some guys, he he, you know, um, because because I remember watching when Angle first broke in in Memphis. Because a lot of times you don't really know because a lot of guys kind of put stuff in their boots, especially the short guys. Um, and actually, a lot of the tall guys too. Now that I think about it, but um, but um, when he was in Memphis, I was like amazed at how short he was compared to so many of the guys there. And that was, and Memphis was not a, a giant territory, although they did have um, Prince Albert was there at the time. It does was McMahon, really tall. Does does he like like tall, huge guys, or is just oh, the, just it, angles that it, he's starting to have short guys? Um, I mean, he always has. The company's always favored that. You know, in fact, Vince always that you kind of had to be bigger than him for him to take you seriously. People said that, and it sort of held true. And you know, Vince is probably six two and a half. So, yeah. and you know, Vince is a, is a good sized guy. And uh, on Monday Night Tour, you know, when uh, Kevin Nash kept on saying Scott Hall and got a big pop and everything like that, and yeah. they said they should bring him back. After yeah. all the stuff that he's done and the money that he was getting paid when he was sitting down, I totally <laughs> dis disagree with them. Do you guys think so they should have brought him back because of a pop? No. I, I, I think that they should have made sure that they're not uh, using their television to get over angles that they're not going to deliver on. But then again, <laughs> that's been the case of, the, of their other angles, too. Um, the... You know, to to me, you know, from what I get, you know, from what I gather, the whole story is is that, um, you know, Kevin Nash, um, he he did it on his own. It was not scripted, and he just figured that nobody would have the guts to ever discipline him. And I'm sure he's right. And I don't and I don't even blame Kevin Nash. Uh, you know, I mean, I think it's a totally unprofessional. I blame the company because uh, they have allowed guys to do all this stuff and never punish them. And at this point, you know, it's not the wrestler's fault. Because the star, you know, I mean, if a mid card guy did it, he would, you know, if a mid card guy had done, done that, uh, they'd have been sat down and they probably wouldn't have been allowed to have a live interview, but they'd have been yelled at and screamed at. If a top guy does it, everyone just kind of looks the other way, and Nash knew it, and Nash knows what he can get away with. But to me, I mean, if I was, if it was, if I was running that company, I mean, I would not let that guy near a live mic the fir after the first time for a long time, and then if he did it a second time, I would just send him home because you got a script and you got a TV show. If he wants to shoot his own angle, he can shoot his own angle from home. You know, you know? those Hey Yo T-shirts that he that he had on last on uh, Monday night. Do you think yeah. he'll be selling them and then giving the money to Scott Hall? No, because <laughs> he's not under contract, so they can't sell his merchandise. Okay, and um, do you guys know where Kamala the who headhunter is? Do you mean the Ugandan giant, the yeah, dreaded Ugandan Kamala? Giant. Uh, uh, yeah, there, there's headhunters and there's Kamala. Um, the last I heard he was living in San Antonio, Julian. Do you know where he's at? No, I, sh I sure don't. I, he, he, isn't he still on the independent circuit? I don't know where he lives. Not, I mean, I think that he, he, he made a lot of money and he saved his money and he went home. Mm -hmm. And he did some independence and then he just kind of faded out. He, he wouldn't be that old right now. I mean, he's only would be... I would say, um, actually, you know what? I think, I think, I, I, I think I'm wrong. I think he actually, he may be very old now that I think about it. Cause it's, I don't know it's, if he's very old. Uh, you think he's very old? Well, I mean, he's been around a while, no doubt about that. But uh, I'm guessing his age is close to fifty. I would think. You know okay, that Ugand that Ugandan in ECW that that's really a ripoff. Could he couldn't sue them for that? Could he? I don't know if he trademarked the uh, Kamala name. Kamala too. Yeah, John Kamala too. Yeah, he. Was, they were they were a tag team. They knew each other too. Yeah. So. Yeah. And but it was, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, if you were if you like build yourself as Hulk Hogan too. Could you? Uh, that? Well, well, I think that that name's trademark. You absolutely can't. You absolutely could. I think that you know Kamala when he came in that you got to remember Kamala came in in the days where nobody trademarked names. But I mean, if you called yourself Hulk Hogan Jr. Oh yeah, they could stop you from doing that for sure. Hmm. You'd have to have the blessing of Hulk Hogan, you know, to not sue you. Because all those uh, gorgeous George Juniors that came in, you know, like uh, when, you know, they, they all had to stop using the name, you know, when they would get in some territory where gorgeous George's uh, widow, you know, actually found out about him. Like, yeah. you know, you know, news didn't, in those days, news didn't travel, so guys could, you know, gorgeous, there was a gorgeous George Jr. He used that name for years and years, claimed to be the son. And then when he came to L.A., and gorgeous George's, uh, one of his ex-wives found out about it, and then he, you know, then he had to change his name. Uh it's it's like uh, did which tor which territory did Kamala draw the most money? Was it Dodo F? Um, I mean, yeah, because everyone drew the most money in WWF because he worked with Hogan. But he um, Kamala was a pretty good draw in Dallas. Um, he headlined a lot in Louisiana with JYD, but um, uh, that was 
Uh, God, those, those matches were horrendous. Um, I, I mean, it probably drew... It didn't draw that good, as I recall, but maybe the undercards were drawn good then because it was a pretty hot time for the territory. But I remember, uh, you know, um, uh, let's see, Duggan. I mean, I think Duggan worked with Kamala a lot, um, which eh, so 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 not that great. Um, Lawler probably uh, did, did very well. Good. Lawler did very well with Kamala um, the first time in in like '82 because that was where he got the gimmick. And it did so well that that's when Kamala became kind of an in-demand guy because of how well he did with Lawler. Uh, you know that guy that had the mask on uh, who always went with Kamala? Was that the Honky Tonk Man? Wasn't Friday? It, wasn't it Steve Lombardi? There were uh, different guys. Um, it was Buddy, it was Buddy, Buddy Wayne, um, which is not the Buddy Wayne that Brian knows, but the original Buddy Wayne in Memphis. Um, Steve Lombardi was Kim, Kim Chi, right? Kim Chi, that, yeah. that was the name, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was Steve Lombardi. And they're... Um, I'm trying to think who else. I think those were the, the main ones. I, I bet there were other guys doing that as well. Do you think uh, WCW will punish the comments Scott Steiner made to Booker T on Monday night about all the welfare stuff and his mom on the corner? Uh, probably not. They'll probably, that, like, that you was know. I would yell at him face to face. What? That was tasteless. Yeah, I, it probably was. He probably did that on his own, too, you know. that. I bet you that wasn't in the script either. <laughs> so Maybe it was. Talk about Tori's face. If you're the top guy. Oh, the Tory's face. Oh, my, well, you know, but at least they bleeped that out. No one actually heard what he said. They didn't bleep it all out. Well, they the, the key stuff they did. Yeah. Then again, what didn't didn't Conan do some of that the other night too? Conan said something like that too. He made some comment. It wasn't it wasn't about acne. I don't think it was just something about her face. Yeah, kind of was. I mean, it wasn't direct, but it was. Subtle, but yeah, it was. A, that's exactly what it was about. So if you're the top guy in WCW, you can say what app whatever you want practically. Mm, Hogan sure could, don't you think? <laughs> the top top guy, yeah, Hogan could do whatever he wants. Um, Nash, <laughs> Nash can do mm, most of what he wants. It seems like, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's just another example. Like professional wrestling, I don't believe will ever be a, in a, there will never be an effective wrestling promotion where the inmates run the asylum. There has to be a leader somewhere, and and this company doesn't got one. And, and about no mercy, why was the crowd so down for some of that event? Like it was some it, some of it was really bad, but like Regal and Midian. Yeah. Well, Regal, well, Regal and Midian, we know why they were down, but um, <laughs> as far as I mean, I think that they were like all listening to the baseball game on their transistor radios or something. <laughs> so, well, I'm probably the, the uh, only guy who enjoys naked Midian. I really? Be. Yeah, you may, you, like you might you might be. be. You may be. <laughs> of, of course, I like them as Finny as Godwin too, so. I, I'm probably his only fan. Um, yeah, you're the only. I'm sure you're the only. Stage loves him. <laughs> well, that's that's why he keeps getting chances. Will, will Survivor Series be a? It's Kurt Angle versus uh, Triple H Survivor Series, right? I don't know that for sure. They may do. You know, I I, I don't know. I mean, I got I got that impression that it was, but um, you know, I don't know. I don't even know if they decided for sure themselves. Are all the are, are all the radicals getting back together since Malenko helped? Benoit and then Saturn came out on SmackDown? Like they're reforming or something? I think so. And I think Guerrero will be too. I think. I don't. I, I kind of was told that, but, you know, again, like these decisions, you know, they change their minds all the time, but it, it certainly looks that way. And also about Kaz, do you think that they, he's learned his lesson that they'll finally give him a push, or is he going to be like this for the next couple years? Who? Kaz? Kaz. Learn about what? I don't know. What, why, why are they putting him on heat as a color commentator when he should be in the ring? I think they like him in that role. They obviously like him more than I do because I haven't been watching Heat. <laughs> but no, they 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 like him in that role, and um, I, I mean I don't see Taz being much higher on the cards than he is now. It's just again, you know, the whole thing with the height and everything. Um, but you know, he's got a spot, and you know, he's making money, so it's okay. I mean, it's not he'll he'll never he's never going to be the guy who chokes everyone out in two minutes like he was in ECW. It, it was never there was never a chance that that would happen in, in WWF and and it never will. But look at Dodo F and Dodo F Taz is a joke and then in WCW Mike Awesome is a 70s guy. Do you, they should have stayed in ECW. But they weren't I would bet you that right now both of them would be so glad they're not in ECW because of the financial situation and, and you know and they're making they're making money and that's you know that's what you want to do in, in the business. As far as Having better matches, yeah, they should have stayed in ECW. Uh, as far as being taken more seriously, yeah, but uh, you know when when you know when you're you never know if you're going to get paid or not, um, and then you got a chance to make big money and you're 
you know, like Mike Awesome, you're 35 years old, you got a, you got a wife and kids. You get your own uh, boss. <laughs> <laughs> and free wardrobe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's got its advantages. Is Scott Steiner going over uh, this Sunday at Halloween Havoc? I expect so. Yeah, I mean, unless they change their mind, I'm, I know that that's the plan, yeah. And about the rumor of Don't Have Blind WCW, what's going on? I haven't heard anything. There's really nothing to be said. I mean, there's there's talks. They're far from being a done deal, and, uh, you know, I mean, no one, you know, we just got to sit and wait. I mean, there's really nothing there's really nothing new to say about it. Okay, thanks for the time, guys. Bye. Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, let's see what else we've got over here. I've got a couple of notes. Um, this is from uh, Jason. As has been discussed recently, WF's toy sales have been poor, and it may get worse. I just received the email or a mail ad for the big toy sale at Ames, which is a low-end department store like Kmart. There weren't any WF products in the whole 24-page catalog. A year ago, the WF items were the oh, toys were the cover items. That's not a good sign. Um, from Matt, who said, speaking of the NWA in the 80s, I just picked up a copy of Starcade 85, and I was wondering what your thoughts were. I thought it was a good show, and I especially love Magnum and Tully. I mean, I mean I'll mean, i tell you, when, when Starcade 85 took place, I thought that was an awesome show um, by the standards of the time. Um, it probably wouldn't look as good today, but at that time I thought, man, you know, like all these, you know, one great match after another, and Magnum and Tully was, you know, for the standards of that time, that's just still one of the best I quit matches that I can recall. That one in um, Ric Flair and Terry Funk, I guess, would probably be my two favorite I quit matches. I don't know. Can you, Julian, what do you think? Any others? Dave, I have that on tape right here at my home, man. I've watched it many times. I've watched it several times this year. Hey, man, I'm from I'm from the Carolinas. That was my thing. That was my era. So yeah, Starcade '85 was one of the greatest wrestling cards I've ever seen, and I'll always pump that one up. No doubt, and Magnum, Magnum was huge too at that time. Now, uh, that was was it Ric Flair and Dusty on top in that one? Rick yeah, yeah, Dusty. Cause it was, yeah, because Dusty, Dusty won the title, right. and then on TV, then on TV they said that uh, because of outside interference, it was a DQ or something, and right. Rick ended up as the champion again. I, well, that was that one wasn't so good. I mean, as far as that aspect of it, well, um, but the card itself, you know, the, it, card, the, the way the it went off was, that night. Oh, I remember watching. You know, they had blood in like in like uh, like they had seventeen guys bleeding one show. Yeah, that was that was unheard of. Good. No, but it was, it was, but it really was a good show. I just remember that. And um, um, Rick and Dusty was a good match. Um, I don't know who the rock and who the rock and rolls worked with on that one. Do you remember? Ivan and Nikita. The... And I think it was good too, wasn't it? It was a great match. You know, considering who you had in there, it's a very good match. There you the, go. The Russians were way over at that time. So was so was the uh, Express. Even Manny Fernandez was on that card. The Raging Bull against Abdullah the Butcher. And you know that was a bleeder. Oh, you know that was a, that was a big bloodbath. Manny Fernandez always yeah. bled a lot. Manny Fernandez. I tell you what. Well, so I was we were watching some tapes over the weekend. I was doing one those doing voiceovers. Manny Fernandez was a hell of a worker. Yes. I mean, I mean, he was a guy who never quite got as far as he should have, which is, was his own fault um, because he self destructed, but. But he in the ring was, was really, really good. I wanted to say this to you guys, man. I got an email. Someone told me to go over and check out the site. It was on one of those days when I wasn't on the Internet. And uh, I saw you guys had me in a poll with uh, Rick Flair and Tom Zink and Edge and Jim Cornette as one of the best guests on the show. And I am totally honored that you guys had me on there, man. I'm just honored to be in that company. If you had well, been on the show two weeks earlier, you might have won. That's, that's, Tom Zink, although that, you know what? Somebody sent me uh, today or yesterday um, a list, like, you know, like excerpts of the show with Zink because they replayed it on Friday. And I was just reading the excerpts and I was just cracking up. I mean, he, that was really, he was really funny. This is from Gene. This is from Gene who wants to know whatever happened to Sonny King? I got Sonny King in the book. Uh, um, I, I don't know whatever happened to Sonny. <laughs> okay. I, have a, I, have a, I have a nice old photo of Sonny in the book. I know that during the latter part of his career he was a manager. And, and if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Dave, Sonny was one of the first black men to ever hold a title in the WWF when he and uh, Chief J. Strongbow uh, won the World Tag Team title. That was WWWF, if I'm not I'm mistaken on that. I believe he would be the first. The first, right, right. Uh, well, okay. I think that perhaps uh, Bobo Brazil at, uh, in the '60s may have come into the WWF and been billed as some sort of a champion. Right. 
I know in the 70s Bobo was billed as U.S. champion. U.S. champion, yes. But I think in the 60s he may have been billed as it, like, real quickly. Um, so that could be, he could have been the first. But as far as a WWF title that, you know, that's historical and it lingered on, right. uh, you know, Sonny King is tag team champion for sure. For yeah. sure was the first question, one. Give me an idea for a guest. How about Scott yeah. Teal? Uh, we had Scott Teal on once. Yeah, Scott, on. Scott helped me out a whole lot with the book, too. Scott's a great guy. Yes, yeah, Scott's a really good guy. Uh, this is from Chev, who says, Kim Chi, Kamala's handler, was once played by the Honky Tonk Man. It was Okay, so this was like an angle. Okay. Uh, it wasn't like the regular thing. It was during a match between Kamala and Jake the Snake Roberts on a Saturday Night Main event. Honky Tonk Man was Kim Chi when he was feuding with Jake at the time. He removed his mask, and Kamala proceeded, him and Kamala proceeded to double-team Jake Roberts. Um, this is the UK London uh, Daily Mail had an article today on Yokozuna that said when he passed away, he weighed more than 42 stone. Now, 42 stone would be... Um, 588 pounds. So that's a number. They also had a quote two weeks before he was eating 240 eggs a day. And what did that same article claim his real name was? I didn't see it. Yokozuna. Didn't they claim his real name was Yokozuna? That's what did they say? The accuracy of the rest of that article. Oh, what did they say? Is, that they said his real name was Yokozuna? That's what, yep. I read an article, yeah, and they said his uh, real name screw was that. Yokozuna. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, then throw it all out. Although I could see 588 pounds being a real number uh, after looking at the picture of him right before, you know, like a week before he died. Also, this is from Reed who says, um, uh, do you send figure four internationally? I live in the U.K. and I would like to subscribe if it's even half as funny as it is as Brian is on the show. <laughs> Actually, it's three times as funny as Brian is on the show, at least, at the very least. Brian, yeah, tell them how they can have, get um, You can get it in the U.K. through Stuart Dougal and... I actually do not have his email address here, but I will send it up to the website so anybody in the U.K. is interested in subscribing can head up there and check it out. Well, Brian, if you had a distribution hookup, you should have turned me. worked hard to find this deal yesterday with company over in the U.K., and you could have turned me on, huh? Oops. <laughs> this deal got set up just a couple of weeks ago. Okay. So off the hook. Okay, this is... Uh, this is Hey, Brian, did you see the Flex Magazine thing, or, or Julian, by any chance? I, I saw that today. Yeah, they listed Papa Pump as number one. Yeah. Uh, gosh. How was the, how was the story? Or was there a story? It was just like five names. Because I, I got this. This is like I, this is from someone who goes, uh, being a provincial champion bodybuilder, which makes him Canadian. Uh, I found this article very funny. How did Kevin Nash, the smartest Nash man in wrestling, on there. yeah, become the smartest man in bodybuilding? I guess he's just got a better physique than Lex Luger, Buff, the Natural Born Thrillers, Landstorm. I would go on and on with the other names, but it would just be too long of a list. He's not smartest in bodybuilding yet till he hits number one. <laughs> hey, he did. He did. He, he got the furthest with, the, with his physique than anyone else. <laughs> Admit that. I mean, he's a, he's ahead of Lex Luger. I mean, could you imagine he's Lex Luger? Yeah, Shamrock. Yeah, Shamrock's on that list too. Okay, well, Ken Shamrock's not even a wrestler, so it, that's like, um, you know, but Lex Luger is, okay? <laughs> and Lex Luger has, like, spent, like, his whole life, you know, like, or, or last ten years of his life dieting so he could look like that year-round, not to mention everything else he's done to look like that year-round. And Kevin Nash, who's been out there partying every night, drinking every night, you know, going to the gym whenever he felt like going to the gym, not going to the gym if he didn't feel like going on that day. And Kevin Nash beats him in the Flex Magazine Best Physique. I mean, that's just like, I mean, Luger, Luger has got to be like wanting to, you know, put a bullet to his head right now. Or Bagwell. The thing about Bagwell, you know, those, you know, with the ego he has. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got to make mention of Bagwell. Um, tonight on WrestlingObserver.com or tomorrow morning, sometime really, really soon, uh, like within the next 24 hours, there will be an article on Buff Bagwell, an interview with Buff Bagwell that Alex Marvez just did with him today. And I just want to let everyone know that. Um, it is quite an astounding uh, interview because uh, WCW, WCW like uh, sent Buff Bagwell to do an interview. The company did, and he proceeded to uh, just say what he. You'll, you'll, well, I guarantee you, we will be talking about this interview tomorrow on this show. So <laughs> just want to warn everyone ahead of time. Well, well, see, that's part of the problem with WCW. I mean, the the, the dumb mistakes that they do like that. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I guess so. Why would you send Bagwell out to represent the company? I, I mean, I think there well, are better people. Yeah. I well, you, well, you guys will definitely be thinking that later. Uh, <laughs> let's go to Let's go to Brian in Rhode Island. Brian, what's going on? 
Hi, uh, I was just like, well, hi, David. Uh, I was just wondering uh, whereabouts of, like, Scott Hall, because I know, like, he just got released, and I was wondering if he was, like, planning on going anywhere or what he was going to do if anybody wanted to take him. I, 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 the only thing I heard, I heard that they've opened up negotiations with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Which he Scott Scott Hall worked for New Japan Pro Wrestling back in the uh, in the late eighties as a yeah, regular. He was Diamond Stud, didn't he? Uh, it was before Diamond Stud. Oh, it wow. was. Um, I think he just went as Scott Hall, as I recall. Um, and and you know they liked him because he was you know big and he was in shape. Mm. You know wasn't they never could push him because at that time you know what's so funny about Scott Hall the Scott Hall of the eighties is that the Scott Hall of the eighties had no charisma. I mean, it was like everybody thought he should have charisma. He's a big guy. He was a good-looking guy. Um, you know, pretty good. You know, pretty good physique. You know, better physique than when actually he was famous. Um, he was not a good worker, but you know, at that time. But it's like the whole knock on Scott Hall was this guy has no charisma. And then, like, you know, here, here we go. And now he's got great charisma, and he's got nothing else. But he's got great charisma. And. Him and uh, I was wondering about Shawn Michaels. Like, if you guys knew if Shawn Michaels was planning on making a return at all, because I've been hearing, I've been hearing a lot of that. Oh, he's going to come back. They liked him on Raw and they want him to come back. And um, I think okay, here, here's the thing. Uh, I think that they like the fact that he's in shape. I've had that mentioned to me. Um, I think that Shawn Michaels probably will wrestle another match. I wouldn't be surprised if it's at WrestleMania this year. I don't see him ever coming back full time. Um, as far as the attitude of the wrestlers most of the wrestlers in the WWF are not particularly fond of Shawn Michaels and a lot of times when they bring him back there's actually a, oh god there was a, a time um and this is probably would go back this was when Russo was there and Russo had called up or, or WWF had called up Shawn Michaels to bring him to a TV taping so this is over a year ago now and this is just an example of the wrestlers and then the word had gotten um, that Michaels was going to do that TV. The word gotten out ahead of time, and the boys were were like so mad that basically they all threatened to revolt practically if Shawn Michaels came in. And Vince Russo, who was the one who called Shawn up to bring him in, when Shawn came in, had to be the one to tell him, uh, Shawn, uh, we, you know, you got to go back home. You're not going to be on TV tonight because basically, if you come in the dressing room, you're going to be strung up alive. <laughs> when was so it? He's not, right after the. Uh... The bite this interview or something? No. I don't know. I don't know the time. I just I just actually heard that story a couple days ago, but it had to do with um, it had to do with um, I don't you know I don't even remember what I think it was just natural. Sean you know Sean just naturally had a lot of heat with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I also I also had somebody tell me yesterday that uh, Edge and Christian are going to break up. Is there any like truth to that at all? Okay, the plan. The reason they did that match, you know, where the losers were going to split up. Was because the plan at that point was to break them up, and then obviously uh, they changed their mind and they came up with the Conquistadors thing. But when the Hardys beat them um, for the tag team titles, that was the whole idea of where it was going at that time. Um, the last asked about it, the idea was they're going to be split up when you know when the time is right. Because I think that there's a feeling that Edge, Edge can be a real superstar. Uh, but I think this is you know not a good time. To me, this is not a good time to split them up. I like the act. And I, I, Christian's, Christian's my favorite guy in the WWF. I'm the biggest Christian mark that I know. And like, he would go nowhere. If they broke up, he'd go nowhere. Just because. That's what, I, that's what I'm afraid of too. It's, he's awesome though. He, I, I yeah, love he, that guy and he, they just push him aside like they do with so many other people. Yeah, he's actually, he's actually the more talent, the more talented of the two. I mean, he's better, he's better, he's a better interview and he's a better wrestler. That's what I you think. Know, and nobody else, but nobody else it, seems to believe me. No, I think pretty much everyone would agree, Brian. Don't you think? Pretty much everyone would say that. I, I mean, think so. Well, I'm out of my friend. I don't know if they just busted my busted my chops or whatever, but that's my friends all tell me. Oh, oh, up, 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 up. I well, think she's the better one of the two. Edge has more of that WWF marquee look because he's like six mm -hmm. three or something, and Christian's yeah. you know five eleven or whatever he actually really is. I don't know. All right, thank you very much. Okay, you're very welcome. Thought it was uh, so evident in the pay per view. Edge looked so clumsy for some reason. And I think I a lot of it had to do, though, with their masks, because when Hardys ran in wearing those masks on the uh, Raw show, Jeff went up top and just about killed Edge with that senton. Like, you couldn't even see a thing. Um, I, 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 they, you know, I mean, Christian looked pretty good in that match, but Edge, when he was in there, I thought I thought it was Aaron Aguilera. You know, because it just looked, looked like such an experienced like guy. Because I, I was surprised. Um, this is from... William, who says to compare concerts and, and this is this is regarding 
I guess unionization actually doesn't make any sense at all, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, you compare concerts and nationally tele televised wrestling events as if they were the same thing. Try comparing a sitcom taped before a live studio audience to a wrestling event. It's a lot better comparison, but that proves you're wrong. I don't know. Uh, how, this how this relates to... Um, how this relates to unionization, somebody tell me at the end. But so you won't, of course. Your entire premise and line of argument is based on sucking up to wrestlers that want to make more money than they're worth. If they're not satisfied with what Vince McMahon pays them, they can seek employment elsewhere and try to command the salaries that you think they deserve. What's that you say? They can't command those salaries elsewhere. They might as well force Vince to pay them more, right? That might make sense if we all live in a communist country. Actually, in a communist country, everyone makes the same. But sorry. <laughs> at least that's the theory behind communism that I studied. <laughs> oh my goodness, um, Julian. Yeah. Um, what as, as far as like uh, the current scene in WCW and sale and and everything? What do you what do you think if WWF gets gets WCW? Do you think it's good, bad, or indifferent for wrestling? Uh, I'm I'm still I'm still warming over on that one. I I I want to think I want to hope that it'll be good, but I'm I'm still I'm just not sure. I, I'm really just not sure, but I've been I've been dissing WCW quite a bit, as most uh, people have been doing. But I want to give WCW credit. Since the last time I was on and I talked about their treatment of black professional wrestlers, I have seen WCW push Stevie Ray out there as a co color commentator, you know, creating terms like yaks and other uh, filling station, bringing back terms like filling station, and they've given uh, every. Uh, black woman that's a nitro girl with some airtime on television and they even gave paydays to a couple of black midgets gary coleman and beetlejuice so i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna re give wcw some credit a black midget hadn't been seen in a professional wrestling ring probably since the haiti kid the haiti in, kid in, in the wwf at wrestlemania 3 so i'm gonna <laughs> give wcw some credit Maybe some of the people were probably, I know they were listening to the show, maybe some of the people were uh, trying to make some corrections there. But I'm not sure, if, uh, as to the question, I'm not sure if I want uh, Mr. McMahon, as much as I respect Mr. McMahon, to uh, control, have that much control over professional wrestling, which he pretty much has now anyway. But uh, I got one I, more. Okay, as someone who grew up in the Carolinas, um, the, the, the remnants of the Carolina Territory, which World Championship Wrestling, you know, of course, bought Jim Crockett Promotions, the last surviving major territory. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is basically, to me, um, if the sale goes through, is, you know, even though the, Carol, the Jim Crockett Promotions territory truthfully died in 1988, this is truly the death of, you know, that, that you know, whatever that uh, legacy is, if you know what I'm saying. And, um as someone who probably, you know, watched basically your entire life, I mean, do you have any kind of like, you know, in a way I, I had those sad thoughts, and in the other way it was just sort of like, well, you know, they, you know, God, I mean, I watched them kill it for so many years, especially the last two, and it's kind of like, you know, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like drove you off anyway. In well, Dave, ways. you caught me. You, you caught me. I've been trying to talk around it, but yeah, that's probably why I have so much apprehension toward it, because as, as bad as WCW has been, uh, they still were the last remaining vestige of what I grew up on with professional wrestling, because as much as I love the WWF now, the WWF really was an acquired taste for me. I grew up with Crockett, so y you got me. I I'm exposed. Yeah, that's why, that's probably the main reason I have more apprehension apprehension than anything else because what I knew of southern style professional wrestling has basically died a violent brutal death yeah especially in the last couple of years Julian I want to thank you very much for being here and of course Brian and uh, thanks Al for producing the show and uh, we'll be back tomorrow at 6 with Gary Capetta